Hello and welcome to uh, the glorious geology of Iceland for everyone. This is part five from Reykjavik to Kvalfjörður. So we have now completed the golden circle, this one here. We went uh, first, of course, to Thingvellir and then all the way to Geysir, the erupting Giza, and to uh, the Golden Waterfall, and then back to Reykjavik. So now we are going to the north, to a beautiful fjord here called Whale Fjord or Kvalifjordur, and we are going to drive this way here. This is road number one. And then we leave road number one and we drive the road along the coast of Kvalfjörðu all the way to the innermost part of the fjord. It is a strikingly beautiful fjord and also has a lot of exciting and interesting geological features to look at. I mention again these uh, books both in English and in German describe in more detail what is discussed here in in the lectures so here is uh, an outline of the excursion that we we are going to undertake now and the locations uh, where i show you photos and discuss processes and the structures are one two three four five six and seven now, if, if you were really driving this uh, road, uh, you leave road number one here and drive along, along road number 47 into the fjord. And then you could either do like we do here in the imagination, drive back the same way, or you could go along the northern coast of the fjord and then through our road tunnel under the sea here and back to Reykjavik. So uh, I will not describe the structures much here. We will see them, of course, on the way, but I will focus on what we see here on the south coast of the Kvalfjörn. As I say, we see the other ones, but the focus is on those parts that we see here on the south coast. The main mountain here is Esia. It's a big mountain. It's a kind of... Uh, complex really composed of uh, uh, some additional mountains that we discuss as well and uh, we start here looking at Asia uh, to the to the east we look to the east and I just remind you that there was a volcano here active volcano so-called Vide volcano was active here around 2.5 2.5 to 3 million years ago, maybe 2.5 million years ago. And we will see some of the structures related to uh, uh, that volcano. So here we have on, on location one, uh, where we see the western slopes of the mountain Asia with regular basaltic lava flows forming the top. The mountain is the highest point of the, point of the mountain is around 900 meters. And uh, we look here to, to the top. This is not the highest point, but it's over 800 meters here. And we see the sub-horizontal lava pile. But underneath, there is some very strange kind of structures. They are thin. They're inclined, or what we say in geology, they're dipping and very thin. And there is a, a kind of gray, even brownish color in the rocks, sometimes a whitish gray color here in the rocks uh, around these, these uh, strange features. Now, these strange features are intrusions. So they're old magma filled fractures. They're called inclined sheets, sometimes cone sheets, and they come straight from a shallow magma chamber that was somewhere down here from the Vide volcano. So these 
inclined sheets then are of the same age as the volcano itself, namely around 2.5 million years old. They are mostly basaltic. And the gray or light colors here are due to geothermal alteration. So this was a high temperature geothermal field. And the heat came partly from these inclined sheets and, and dikes that you see here everywhere, mainly the inclined sheets here, and also from the from the shallow magma chamber that is located somewhere under the sea, but close to this location here, uh, which would to today be a uh, presumably a, a gabbroic pluton, a gabbroic body. When we try further, we see no longer inclined sheets, but vertical dikes. They stand up here, and this location is exactly where we leave road one and drive into uh, the, the fjord itself along road number 40, 47. So these are basaltic dikes, and you see they're close to vertical. I will explain later on why they're not quite vertical. They're cutting through basaltic lava flows again and belong to Asia and belong to a dike swarm that we'll, we will see much more of later on the coast of, of Kualifjöld. So they're partly so-called regional dikes, that is dikes coming from great depths, from deep-seated reservoirs using the primitive magma, and partly they're radial dikes coming from the shallow magma chamber but propagating laterally. So this is a typical uh, internal structure of a volcanic system in Iceland and many divergent plate boundaries. We have a deep-seated magma reservoir. Where is this magma reservoir located? Well, we have found many in the active parts of Iceland today. They're usually somewhere at around 15, 20, even 25 kilometers depth. They are much larger than the shallow magma chamber they supply magma to, but they are not totally molten. They're partially molten. So there is not magma everywhere here. It's, it's, it's in little holes, little pores. Uh, so it's called the, it's a porous meteor, or porous medium, really, where the magma is located. Then we have the shallow magma chamber. That is much smaller and has a roof top, usually somewhere between one kilometer be below the general surface to maybe five or six kilometer depth. And when it solidifies, it usually becomes either a, uh, an acid or felsic body or a mafic or basaltic or caproic body. Uh, that can also sometimes be seen because in Iceland, the erosion due to the glaciers is nearly two kilometers in the deepest parts. So we can often see the old shallow magma chambers, uh, the uppermost part as caproic plutons or something similar. So here we see this. We have the regional dikes that are usually rather thick of primitive composition. They are basaltic with low, relatively low silica content. And they come straight from this magma reservoir. And in the last uh, two years, we have been seeing exactly that happening on the nearby Reykjanes Peninsula in Southwest Iceland, where we've had two volcanic eruptions coming straight from a deep seated uh, reservoir and not meeting with any shallow magma chamber. The Reykjanes Peninsula is unusual in that there are no shallow magma chambers there, except when we go east to the Hingit volcano, which I discuss later in, in these lectures or talks. So the regional dikes come, come from there. But if we have a shallow chamber, as we had in the Asia area uh, 2.5 million years ago, then a lot of inclined sheets, as we saw already in the, in the fossil geothermal field there, they are injected and also thin radial dikes we see here. So the inclined seats are here and the radial dikes, which can be vertical, but much thinner and often more evolved with uh, with uh, higher silica content than the regional dikes. 
So we have deep seated reservoirs that supply magma to shallow magma chambers. And from deep seated reservoirs, we get the regional dikes, like we're having now in, uh, or had in the last two years in the Reykjanes Peninsula. And uh, from the shallow chamber, we get often more evolved, more silica rich magmas, and we get inclined sheets and radial dikes. And you could ask, why do we have these inclined sheets? Is because of the local stress field. So the stress field here is just the plate tectonic stress field, the, the divergent plate boundary stress field, the rift zone stress field. But here, because of the shape of the timber, the stress field changes. And in above part of the timber, in, in a part of the roof of the timber, the injections, the magma field fractures will be inclined, will be inclined. So when we drive into the fjord, we come to an interesting uh, kind of peninsula on the, on the south, uh, south coast, made of sand or gravel here, yeah, called Kvalfjarðareyri. This is what we call sand spit, sand spit. Why do we have this sand spit? They're very common. They form by sediments. They are, these are all sediments of sand and gravel and so on. And they accumulate when the sea loses its carrying power. Then, then they fall down and accumulate and, and pile up there. So this is called sun speed. Now, we will look at dikes and structures uh, to the west to the west of this sun spit here. There are also dikes and, and faults and structures to the east along the coast, but we will focus on those to the west. So here's one of the first dikes we see if you walk along the coast. It's around 1.5 meter thick. It's basaltic, has very nice cooling or columnar joints. I will mention them later and discuss them. But what we see here also are mineral veins so fractures filled with secondary minerals and also little amygdales or crystals. Some of them are zeolites, others may be quartz and, and so on and so forth. These are all related to circulation of geothermal fluids. So initially, say 2.5 million years ago and, and probably longer, much longer, uh, more recent than that, there was a geothermal field here and the water uh, from the geothermal field, which was, of course, uh, uh, geothermal fluids, they generated these amygdales, these crystals, and these mineral veins. Now we see a, a, a typical regional dike. It's three to four meters thick. You see the people here for scale and dipping or inclined around 80 degrees. Uh, to the west, to the northwest, and I will explain it better later. But this inclination is because the whole pile, the whole lava pile, has tilted towards towards the rift zone in Think, which is located in Thingwetli now. So the whole pile has tilted, and therefore the dike that was initially vertical, the dike was initially vertical. When the pile tilted like that, the dike became inclined or tilted and to the west, and to the west, to the northwest. So initially, close to the surface, these dikes were vertical, but now it's dipping or inclined by 80 degrees uh, uh, to the west or to the northwest. This is a universal feature you see in, in Iceland. You see always this tilting of the lava pile towards, towards the active rift zones, mostly in that case. So it's mostly til tilting towards the present rift zone. There are some irregularities, but mostly the tilting or the dip of the lava pile in Iceland is towards the present rift zones or present volcanic zones. All right. So now we see the side of this dike, the uh, west side of this dike, and we see very nicely the, the cooling or columnar joints. There's a lady here for scale. And we see also now, or we can imagine, 
that these dikes, regional dikes, uh, four, five, or even one dike there on the uh, on the coast is twenty five meters thick. So these kind of dikes, they act as barriers to fluid flow. Now, when this volcano was active two point five million years ago. The fluids that the dike would have captured and con conducted along its margins or inside the dike would have been geothermal fluids. Today, dikes of this kind, both in Iceland and elsewhere in the world, they act as channels for groundwater. For groundwater. So when we are looking for groundwater anywhere in the world, we look for dikes and faults. And that's where we would expect to find it. Now, when we are in an active area or recently active area, the dikes also contact geothermal fluids. So we, we look for geothermal springs in the vicinity of, of thick, reasonably thick dikes and faults, of course. Now, you see, in addition, where the lady is standing and above her head, there are Big fractures here, horizontal fractures. Now, these fractures were not in the dike when it was at depth in the crust. They were formed when this became eroded, when the fjord was formed by erosion, mainly by, by Pleistocene glaciers. And then the whole area became uplifted. So the joints are formed later. They would not have been there when the dike functioned as a conduit for geothermal fluids and later for, for groundwater. So what was the depth? Where were these dikes, the, the one we just saw, and this one, which is also on the coast in Qualifier, these parts of the dikes, dikes are of course very tall and often very extensive. They can be 10, 15 even kilometers tall and similar in, in the lateral or horizontal dimension. These are not so big uh, because they are not so thick, but uh, they can extend down to depth of at least 10 kilometers if they're regional. But if they're local from the shallow chambers, they would extend to depth of maybe a few kilometers. So what is the depth in the old crust where this, this part of the dike is seen here. Well, we can find it out. We can find it out. We simply look at two things. One, the height of the tallest mountains in the vicinity of the area. And they all, the, the tall mountains like Skalsedi and close to it by Essia itself, they rise to close to or above thousand meters above sea level. That means the erosion must have been at least thousand meters. And secondly, we look at secondary minerals, quartz, zeolites, and so on, and they form under special pressure and temperature conditions in the crust. And we can then relate those pressure conditions to depth, because the deeper we go in the crust, the higher is the pressure, or what we would call normally structural geology, the higher is the vertical stress. So we can, from these things, infer what was the depth of this part of the dike that we see here at the coast in Qualfjord. And the depth was around 1,200 meters, 1,200 meters. So the glaciers have eroded around 1,200 meters of the crust. So we are looking into the old drift zone that was here 2.5 million years ago. We are looking into it at a depth of 1,200 meters. So we could ask, uh, how quickly do these dikes propagate? How quickly does the magma move? Well, we have very good data on that. Particularly, as I said earlier, we got wonderful data on that now in, in the last two years uh, when we had the two eruptions in the Reykjanes Peninsula in the mountain called Fjall, 
uh, where earthquake swarms told us how quickly the magma was moving. But we have numerous earthquake swarms all over the world to indicate the velocity of propagation of, of dikes or magma-filled fractures. They are usually, it ranges more than I indicate here, but they're usually between 0.1 to 1 meter per second. Now, what, what is that? Well, it's similar to the, to the velocity we walk at. So it's the pacing of a human being. So it's the velocity we walk at. But when did the columnar joints, those beautiful joints we see everywhere in the dice, they're horizontal because they always form in a direction perpendicular to the cooling surface, which would have been here. So the host rock or the rock that was hosting the dike would have been here and is now eroded away. The dikes are often harder, more resistant to erosion than, than the, the surrounding rock. So they stand up as, as cliffs like this one. Sometimes they're weaker and then they form canyons. But often they are a little bit harder or more resistant to erosion, so they form these kind of cliffs. So the dike magma here at depth was at the temperature around 1200, 1300 degrees. It stopped moving. It couldn't move when it had cooled down to around 1000, even 1100 degrees. Then it was solid, we say, but still extremely hot. But the cooling joints, the column joints, didn't start to form then. They formed much later. They only formed when the dike had cooled down to around 807 to 800 degrees. And the cooling time, the time it takes the dike first to solidify and then cool gradually down to 800 degrees and then down to the temperature in, in the surrounding rocks, depends on the thickness of the dike in the second power, in the power of two. So if we have a dike that is 20 meters thick and we compare its cooling time with a dike that is four meters thick, then this dike, 20 meters, is five times thicker and it will then take it 25 times longer to solidify and to cool down. So if you are dealing with a thick dike, it can take easily hundreds of years or even more, thousands of years to reach the temperature of the surrounding rock. And all the time, all the time, the dike is acting as a heat source for a geothermal field. When it is totally cooled down to the surrounding uh, temperatures, it can still contact uh, warm fluids or later on, uh, groundwater. So there are not only inclined sheets and vertical or so vertical dikes in the qualifier area, there are also sills. Here we are uh, looking to the south. We have moved on and we are looking to the south to a mountain called Eirafjall, which is part of the Asia complex. And you see now here very nicely the inclination or the dip of the lavas. These are mostly basaltic lavas. They're all dipping here to the east or southeast towards the, the volcanic zone or the rift zone in southwest Iceland, namely towards Thingvelli, the main graben in Thingvelli. So they're dipping in that direction. And this explains again why the dike that was initially vertical is now dipping that, like that to the west to the northwest. In addition, as I say, we have sills. Now, sills are sometimes called baby magma chambers. So sills have a potential to become shallow magma chambers. This one obviously did not, because in Iceland, where the spreading rate, the opening rate is very slow, the sill has to be very thick to have a chance to become a magma chamber, say, hundreds of meters or something like that, or at least many tens of meters or even hundreds of meters, because it has to stay liquid and receive new magma if it is to develop into a magma chamber. And the dike injection frequency in Iceland is very low because the spreading rate is only 1.8 centimeters per year compared to some places in, in the Pacific Ocean 
East Pacific rice, for example, where the spreading rate is 17, 18 centimeters per year. And there you get dikes every three, four, five years. So even little sills, thin sills, can there become magma chambers and stay as magma chambers. But here we would need a thick one to receive magma every 50 or 100 years and still stay liquid. So this obviously was too thin. Uh, the scale here is, is uh, these hay bales here wrapped in white plastic, uh, as is common in many places. Uh, you see them here, they indicate indicate the scale. There are also summer houses here. Uh, and uh, people are growing some trees here in this area. And the summer houses and the hay bales indicate, indicate the, the, the scale. Now we are looking to the north of the fjord. And there we see the remnants of a volcano. Now this volcano called Thuvefjat was a part of a larger composite or strato or, or polygenetic or central volcano, whatever you want to call them. These are volcanoes that live hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years. In Iceland, for example, they commonly live around six, seven hundred thousand years. They're commonly active for six, seven hundred thousand years, these volcanoes. So this one is a part of the Qualfjord volcano which was active around 3 million years ago. There are some rhyolitic layers here, so acid or felsic layers here, which are commonly found in, in, in old central volcanoes. In addition, this has a very nice feature. It has a part of, or remnants of, a neck or plug. What is a neck or plug? It's an old main conduit in the central volcano. The main conduit where the magma came up. I've also schematically indicated the possible original surface of the volcano. Clearly hundreds of meters have been eroded of it, mainly by the glaciers of, of the Pleistocene. And to the east of this volcano, here is another mountain. And that's a very special mountain. It is called Brekku Kampu. You see it now here. This is Thuvefjall and here's Brekku Kampu. It's very special because it's mainly or largely made of lake sediments. Of lake sediments. How can it be? There was lake here. Was there lake here in this, this high altitude? Well, this mountain is located within a collapse caldera, the collapse caldera of the quality of the volcano. And in that collapse caldera, which I explain in a moment, there was a lake. And inside the lake, these sediments, brown sediments, formed. And later on, these sediments were intruded by intrusions, inclined sheets, uh, sills, and dikes, as I'll show you in a moment, from the same quality of the volcano. So, just to remind you, a collapse caldera is a piston like subsidence. So, it subsides into the shallow magma chamber. And sometimes, it subsides a few hundred meters or several hundred meters, but occasionally it subsides nearly all the way through the chamber and squeezes out all the magma. And then we can have a large eruption from a relatively small magma chamber. So uh, the subsidence occurs along these fractures here, where I have these arrows. These are ring faults, the caldera is often a ring shape or slightly elliptical in geometry at the surface in plan view. I show only the half the caldera here. And often there is an intrusion here, sometimes very thick, called a ring dike, a ring dike. So the Qualfjord volcano at one stage in its development formed a collapse caldera and it subsided probably many hundred meters or even one kilometer or so. And inside that sub subsided area, a lake formed. 
And inside this lake, there were lake sediments. And these lake sediments, these brown lake sediments we see in Brecucumber, were formed there. So everything outside has eroded away and, and the old lake sediments stand now as a mountain. Why are they standing as a mountain when they're made of lake sediments? Well, they're partly stronger to erosion because they have so many intrusions. The intrusions, the inclined seeds, uh, dikes and sills, they make them stronger or more resistant to erosion. So here we have a close-up of, of, uh, of Brecucumber, where we see the lake sediments, these brown layers here, and a lot of intrusions, often quite irregular, because these sediments have not a very specific stress field. So this, the, the, uh, the intrusion can go in a rather irregular, in a regular manner inside. So we see very nicely the lake sediments and the intrusions there. And all these intrusions made this part here relatively strong to erosion. So it stands today, after all the glacial erosion, as a mountain. As a mountain. Now we are going to go to the innermost part of Kvalfjörd. And you see, it's a beautiful fjord with the many mountains. We will look at all these mountains close to the end of the talk. I will mention this uh, mountain theory here, which is composed of two, two lava shields, two lava shields. Then I will mention, of course, the beautiful table mountain, Kvalfet, and the older uh, higher class that mountain, a more complex one, Botsulur. So this one is younger than that one. And I will also show you a beautiful graben here in Mulafjall. Now, why is it so important to show a graben in Mulafjall? Well, because Mulafjall, as I'll show you in a moment, is only around 15 kilometers away from the Thingwedli Graben or, thing, or uh, the faults in, in the Thingwedli Graben or the Thingwedli Fisher Swarm. Therefore, by looking at the Graben in Mulafjall, we can understand what all these big fractures we see at the surface in the rift zone in Iceland today in the western, in the western rift zone, uh, Thingwedli and, and in cutting through Botswana as well and, and other places there. We can see what they look like at depth, at depth in the crust, because this is all eroded. The sea level here is, as I told you earlier, is around 1,200 meters below the initial surface of the rift zone two or three million years ago. So we can look here at this, the graben is here, and the graben is then at around 900 meters below the initial top. So we can kind of speculate what the faults at Thingwedli look like deep in the Earth's crust by looking at these, these uh, structures there. So to, to put this in perspective, so we are going to look at this, uh, uh, at this uh, graben here. We're going to look at this graben here. Uh, and we say that this graben is is only around 15 kilometers. You see the scale here. It's around 15 kilometers away from the active faults in in the western uh, rift zone or the western volcanic zone in Iceland. So Thingwedl is here. The, the Thingwedl fractures are here, and then there are older fractures, but but related to the the same rifting are here. So we will look at the, uh, the boundary faults of think whether to compare them with what we see in the graben here, in the graben here. So just to remind you, I've showed this one earlier in, in these talks. This is the thing with the graben in winter times, covered with snow. And we see here Almanagao, the eastern, the west, sorry, the western boundary fault. 
and Rab Nagyau, the eastern boundary fault, and both have displacement subsidence along the faults themselves, so sort of between the walls on the western side and the wall on the eastern side, around 30 meters. And you will see that is exactly that is exactly the displacement of the faults we will see in this little graben in 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 Kvalfjord. Uh, the, the total graben here is, is five kilometers wide, but the graben we see in Kvalfjord is much, much narrower. But the displacement, the movement on the faults is very similar. So that's the graben. So here, as I say, we are standing around 1,200 meters below the initial top of the pile. And we see here a graben is not very wide. It's uh, only around 170 meters or something that wide. But the displacement here is 30 meters, and the total displacement on many faults to the east is also around 30 meters. So we are here 900 meters below the initial, below the initial top of the lava pile. This was active, say, two or three million years ago. And we see here a graben, and we see boundary faults or faults in the graben that are in many ways analogous to what we see in the active rift zone in Thingwedler or, or Botsulu, just 15 kilometers to the east. So this gives us a, a three-dimensional three view of, of what these faults could look like at, say, 900 or 1,000 meters depth in the crust. Just to remind you what what graben is, graben is basically a, a subsidence of a wedge-shaped part of the crust between two main normal faults, the so-called boundary faults that are indicated here. Usually we, we judge the, or we measure the displacement, the movement on, on the fault by find, finding a marker layer. A marker layer is a layer that is easily distinguished from other layers in, in the lower pile, and therefore we can measure the displacement in that way. And that's exactly that's exactly what we did uh, in, in uh, the Graben in, in Mulafjall, that I will come to uh, again in, in a moment. So we have here this displacement. Now, the, the faults are not necessarily inclined uh, at the surface. They are inclined if they go through relatively soft rocks like sedimentary rocks or hyaluroclastites. But if they go through pahoi hoi lava flows like in Thingwedli, they become vertical close to the surface and at the surface. And they become vertical. So now we have a close-up of, of the Mulafjall uh, graben. And we see that this fault here has a displacement of 30 meters. And that's the marker layer, marker horizon. This one here is a hyaloclastite layer, very easily seen. So it comes in here, falls down here, 30 meters, and then it rises a little bit here. There's an, another fault here. There's a small fracture here, but it's not with a displacement really. So there's another fault here. Then it rises again up here, fault three, and rises again up here, fault four, and here and there, it's at the same elevation in the crust. So this part here from there to there, around 170 meters, has subsided, has subsided by 30 meters, exactly, or more or less exactly the same as we see the current subsidence along, uh, particularly Almanagao in Thingwetli. So this tells us what these faults can look like, the Almanagao and Rabnagao and all the big faults in, in Thingwetli, what they can look like at 900 to 1,000 meter depth in the crust. There is a breccia here, so-called fault rocks, and so on. I don't go into the details here, but this shows you why it is so important to go into the field and look at the structures at depth or where the erosion has taken place so you can get a three-dimensional view, so you can understand the processes going on at the surface 
you have a three-dimensional view of what the structures look like at depth, and therefore you understand the process at the surface much, much better. Now the dip here is around 70, 70, 71 degree. And in fact, we measured, uh, my colleague and I, we measured the displacement here by simply walking up here and measuring this, uh, this vertical distance here. And of course, for all the other faults. Now we come to a, a mountain called Therid. It's notorious for often having strong wind and uh, it's composed of two lava shields. One is relatively light gray here. And then there's a contact here, and there's a dark gray layer underneath. So this is one lava shield. This is another one. Now, do we know any lava shield? Well, very close by here is, in fact, uh, a famous one called Skjaldbreiður, north of Thingvelli. And so we are looking at something similar, but in cross-section, a depth in the crust to those uh, holes in lava shields. This, these, of course, are are two to three million years old. Uh, there are some hyaloclastic layers uh, inside here, but you see also that when you follow the contact, it is not at the same level everywhere. It goes up and down. Why? Because of faults, mainly normal faults. Normal faults are very common in, in this mountain here. Here, in fact, are lake sediments. If you, if you ever go here, uh, beautiful lake sediments to look at. But we focus now on, on this one, theoretically. So here's a close-up. That's the upper shield, light gray in color. Here is the lower shield, which is dark, more dark gray. And here are the lake, lake sediments. So we see the faults. And at each fault location, the contact has shifted. The contact is up here in this at this fault, but down here, there. So in fact, my colleague and I, we measured all these faults here on foot by simply climbing up here and using a clinometer to measure the elevation difference uh, based on this contact here. Uh, for those of you who want to do field work in, in geological field work in areas like this one, just a, a little uh, word of warning. These screes are particularly boring to, to work at. Uh, you tend to slide down and, and uh, uh, in each step, but uh, you will make it uh, in the end. So this, this mountain here is very, very well uh, located for such a study because it has uh, for a study of, of faulting because it has many faults. And they have this, we have this market horizon, this one, and there are others up, up here. So you can measure the displacement and measure the orientation of the faults. And then you can compare them again with the fault you see in the active rift zone a few tens of kilometers away in Thingwelli. So that again here we have, we have uh, information that we can use to understand processes that happen and are seen at the surface today. So here's a close-up of it just to show you the contact very well. You see these uh, two uh, lava shields are, are, are quite different in, in, in structure. And this one is the dark one, and that's the light gray one. And they are cut through here. So fault, for example, they're cut with numerous normal faults. Not so very many dikes in this area, mainly faults and mainly normal faults. So normal faults is when one of the one side has subsided relative to the other one, like that. They're always related to extension, to rifting, to extension or rifting. Then we go to the innermost part of Valfjörður, and there we have a, a beautiful valley now covered with trees, uh, planted trees, um, uh, mainly conifers uh, imported from Alaska, in fact. Uh, but for us, geologically, this is a beautiful example of a table mountain. It's called Kvalfet, the whale mountain. And it was formed probably 150,000 years ago in the second last, uh, second last uh, ice period. So it has been eroded a little bit, uh, but there is a pile of, of lava flows here on the top 
and then higher clusters underneath. And probably somewhere here, you might possibly find some pillow lavas. So it's a classic uh, uh, table mountain. We have seen table mountains earlier in, the, in these uh, lectures. Uh, this is a classic one, but this is older than those we saw in, in the thing with the area. Those are very young, 20,000 years old maybe, but this one's around 150,000 years old, but rises to one to 850 meters above sea level. So there's a very beautiful area here, and there's popular hiking areas to waterfalls and, and so on in this area. Very, very nice, very nice area. To the south of Kvalfeld is uh, as a mountain called Botsulu, which is also a high cluster mountain with several peaks, the highest peak uh, rising to nearly 1100 meters, which again tells you how we can try to infer in, in some places erosion, but one has to be careful because these high cluster mountains, of course, are, are mainly constructional structures, mainly constructional structures formed by eruptions and, and the glacier. They're not, not entirely erosional structures, but anyway, this has suffered quite some erosion because it's probably around 250,000 years old, so 100,000 years older than Valfet, and is, is much more eroded. But still, there are peaks here up to nearly 1,100 meters. Here you see the uh, part of the valleys here, and uh, they're, they're planting a lot of, lot of trees, and overall, a very, very beautiful area. As we see also here on the last photo, uh, see the river, going here into the sea we are looking to the southwest now and again we are in the innermost valley of Kvalfjordur and that's where we end our journey and you see here perhaps better than before even how the lava pile the dip or the inclination of the lava pile how it increases with depth so this arrow here has clearly a uh, a steeper dip or steeper inclination than this one there, but all of them, all of them, all of the lavas are dipping or inclined to the east or southeast, namely towards the present volcanic zone, the west volcanic zone, or to Thingvedler. So with Thingvedler and, and these words, I think I say thank you very much indeed, and bye-bye. Uh,